Assalamu alaikum, Eysiz Meymanlı, Şerqi Türkistanlı vatandaşla, Amerikanın paytakti, yani Amerikanın devlet meclisi, da içilgan Şerqi Türkistan Uyghur Ali Kengişicilerine hoş geldinler. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, distinguished guests, and the honorable members of Congress. With great pleasure, I welcome you to the official opening ceremony of the conference, The Future of the Uyghur People in East Turkestan. This conference is organized by the World Uyghur Congress. It's co-sponsored by Freedom House, uh, the Uyghur American Association, and the International Uyghur and Human Rights Foundation. Democracy Foundation. It's an international conference with historic significance for the Uyghur people. The main goal of the conference is to provide a constructive forum for the Uyghur leaders from around the world to discuss the ongoing and the severe violations of the Uyghur people's civil, political, social, economic, and cultural rights in East Turkestan by the Chinese government. To begin, I would like to invite Uyghur democracy leader, Madam Rabia Kadir, to uh, make her official opening remarks. Rabia Khan. Assalamu alaikum. Barilik, Şarkı Türkistan'nın takdiri üçün kinship, vatanimiz Şarkı Türkistan'nın erkilliği ve azatlığı üçün Mişad şunun yol haritası sıcakta dünyanın hem yerden kegen kırındaşlarımız bugün Amerika'nın merkezi ve Amerika'nın siyasi merkezi boğan kapital kanının işi de meclis kanı da hem münlevlen bir yerge cemleşkinimizden nait memnun sılge çok ali ihtiram bildirmen rahmet keginin lege. Şunun ulan Amerika din kegen mihmalla Kongres Senatör Enedi Freedom House hem barlık e, mihmallarımızga için konumda rahmet etmen. Biz bugün e, taşlanıp ketmi geldiğimizde muşu dünyanın hem yerden kegen barlık Halkımızın takdiriye kongul belvatkan, şarkı Türkistan'ın takdiriye kongul belvatkan, vatandaşı turmladı yitvatkan, tutuluvatkan, itilvatkan, halk kongulvatkan, halkımızın mişagi topluşşidin, bizden halkımızın jitim kamaydıgalıgı ve özümüzden mi özümüzge iyi çıkalaydıgalıgız ve bizden muş kaptal halının işidir. Bu şirin açılışımız dünyanın bizden taşlı etme geldiği ve manın muşundak bir sorulla da bizki siyasi sorunu hazırla bir vatkalıgı bizden takdirimizge kumul bir vatkalıgı biz dünyadan hem yerden kilip bir yerde toplaşkanlığımız özümüzden takdirimizde özümüzden çokun taşlamayı halkla dalgımız bu sorunu bizki hazırla bir meyli kongresim bolsun meyli sanatırdım bolsun meyli kumrais vurdum bolsun meyli kişilik o koktaştıklatları eministi international Freedom House olsun, Muşu Amerika'daki yukarı derecelik siyasi yollarının meşagi kilit bütün dünyadan çıkılgan Uyghur ve Şarkı Türkistanlı kırındaşlığa meşagi dekilat bir işi silahını biz taşlıp etmeyimiz. Silahının akın adı biz bu. Silah çokum üzenlerinin erkilikliği üzenler çıkısla. Silahının erkilikliğinle üçün biz her yerde silahının ağzımız, ağzınla bulumuz. Değiştin ibaret ve şunun dün direktör buldu. Ben bir gün özümüzden şu üç yıllardan biri, altmış yıllardan biri gözlerimizden kan yaş temip muşak ellerine arzu kandık. Ben bir gün Amerika'nın Washington'da muşak haptal halının işi de muşak kongur senatör ve bütün siyasi on tepkikatçılarımız her üstün bizde dekilat bir işi, cevap bir işi ve birlikte bizden kuruluşu asası da Muşu sorunga birlikte cem bulalı kallığımızdan halkımız haberdar olsa kançı öğüt gelip git etdi, kançı hoş olup git etdi deyip olayım ben. Bana bugün bütün Otlu Asya'daki, bütün Şarkı Türkistan'daki, bütün dünyadaki Uyghurlarımız körü atıdı. Radio Free Ajad'ın nef meydanını beri atıdı. Biz özümüzden azatlığı üçün ve özümüzden takdiri üçün kaptıl kılının işi de 
Sadarımız ne? Dünyada bir vatımız. Bizden ağzımız bugün bütün gayet dünyası, bütün dünya, bütün Asya, bütün dünyada muşul. Oydun tarkılı da. Ben bir gün muşu sorunu kilit, cenelişip özümüzden takdiri ve bizden takdirimiz için fikir kıvat kallarının her insiye rahmet etmen. Bir gün bizden cihanımızdan eçilişi başlandı. Ben eçiliş marasını bilen Şarkı Türkistan ağlı iken şirdeki barlık dünyadaki cihanımın milyon oygırını ve Şarkı Türkistanlıkını çin kılımdan tebrik edin. Rahmet. Rabia Hanım Allah'a idare etmet. I would like to read her official statement in English. It's an honor to welcome you to the official opening ceremony of the con conference, the future of the Uyghur people in East Turkestan. Our presence in the U.S. Capitol building, at the very heart of democracy, speaks to the political aspirations of millions of the Uyghurs across the globe. Our presence at the U.S. Capitol also shines a light on the strong and unwavering support of our friends from the United States. I would like to thank all of the speakers today, from Congress, from the human rights community, and the academia, who have always been ready to defend Uyghurs from Chinese government repression. It is frequently said that Uyghurs are forgotten people. However, our friends remind us that this is not so. The great progress made by democratic Uyghur organizations would not be so formidable without the resolute support provided by the National Endowment for Democracy. And it is long-standing concern for the conditions and future of East Turkestan has touched the hearts of the Uyghur people. I would also like to thank Freedom House for us co-sponsoring this conference. Freedom House's reputation for speaking out for the voiceless is admired across the human rights community. We are proud to have their commitment to this conference. Since July 2009, unrest in Urumqi, the Chinese authorities in Beijing and Urumqi have pursued policies that aim to further marginalize the Uyghur people. Chinese government political repression and a fierce assault on freedom of speech that aims to suppress Uyghur hopes for human rights and democracy has been accompanied by vicious policies of assimilation that are gradually er eroding the fabric of the Uyghur society and the Uyghur people's very cultural identity. In the light of this decisive juncture in political, economic, social, and cultural conditions in East Turkestan, this conference comes at a critical time in the history of the Uyghur people. The historical importance of this conference cannot be understated. It is the first occasion in modern times that Uyghurs have come together from across the political spectrum, that it is happening when we as the indigenous people of the East Turkestan are facing an existential threat. As a unique people is no coincidence. To the Uyghur delegates who have traveled from many countries to participate, I welcome you to Washington, D.C. The conference will provide the kind of forum for the Uyghur voices so lacking in China, but so key to understanding the Uyghur perspective on current conditions and the direction of our people. Uyghurs will be able to express their opinions freely and listen to new perspectives as we democratically develop common strategies and effective political platforms. It is important to remember that even despite our difference, we are united in our commitment to the freedom of the Uyghur people as one. Robust democracies are defined by freely expressed points of view, competing opinion and respect for divergent standpoints. The building toward a strong future for our people is contained within opportunities such as this conference. We must step up confidently, seize this opportunity, and show our people that it's not the authoritarian government in Beijing who defines us, but it is we, the we. And then James McGovern, Congressman McGovern, in serving his eighth term at the U.S. Congress. At the moment, uh, Congressman McGovern serves as a minor senior minority whip, the second-ranking Democrat on the Powerful House Rules Committee, which sets the terms for debate and amendments on most legislation, and a member of the House Agriculture Committee. 
Mr. McGovern is also co-chair of both the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission and the House Hunger Caucus. Since his election in 1996, Congressman McGovern has been widely recognized as a tenacious advocate for his district, a tireless cr crusader for change, and an unrivaled supporter for social justice and fundamental human rights. Let's welcome Congressman McGovern. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Aleem, and I appreciate uh, the invitation to be here. And I want to welcome all of you to the uh, nation's capital. And I want to thank all of you for your international efforts to protect and promote the most basic human rights of the Uyghur people. I'm sad to say that uh, there are few people in the United States who I think fully realize that various regions of China were once autonomous and independent countries. Most people could identify Tibet and its spiritual leader, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, whom I've had the honor to meet. Many books have been written about Tibet. Many movies and documentaries have been made about Tibet. And events, of, and, and events that affect Tibet tend to be covered by major U.S. and international press. Altogether, they have helped make Tibet more of a household name around the world. Meanwhile, its neighboring, regi its neighboring region, which the Uyghur people know as e East uh, Turkmenistan, and which the People's Republic, uh, Republic of China officially calls the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, it is a mystery to many people in my country. It is certainly a region of the world that is still largely unknown to the majority of Americans and the world community at large. And I include many members of the United States Congress. Sadly, if Americans have heard of Uyghurs at all, who are the 8 to 10 million Turkic Muslim ethnic community living in this northwestern uh, region of China, it is unfortunately in a very di different context, that of Guantanamo. While the U.S. government under the previous administration had determined early on that the Uyghurs held, held at Guantanamo were innocent and were not enemy combatants, and a U.S. court even ordered the release of these Uyghur prisoners into the United States, since to return them to China would have almost certainly resulted in their execution or at least severe torture and detention, there are still a few Uyghurs remaining in Guantanamo today. And we've had to rely on such small countries as Albania, Bermuda, and Paolo to help correct our mistakes by accepting these Uyghurs for resettlement. And they are now eking out uh, peaceful lives in those countries. I certainly don't need to tell you that Uyghurs continue to be harshly repressed by the Chinese government. It is unconscionable. China considers any expression of cultural diversity an act of treason and sedition, punishable all too often by death, and generally following blatantly unfair trials, often held in complete secrecy. In July of 2009, the ongoing suppression and attacks on Uyghur, uh, on Uyghur culture resulted in open mass protest, which again was met with harsh violence, mass arrests, executions, and incommunicado detentions. As a result, I introduced bipartisan legislation, HRES 953, to express the condemnation of the U.S. House of Representatives regarding the crackdown and the continuing violation of basic human rights in Xinjiang. I had hoped that the bill would have been debated, voted upon, and approved in December, but we were not successful in bringing it to the House floor before the Congress adjourned. I intend, to, uh, I intend to introduce similar le updated legislation in support of basic human rights for the Uyghur people in China later this year, perhaps in July, marking the two-year anniversary of the tragic crackdown in Xinjiang. <coughs> Finally, I would like to recognize Rabia Kadir, who has worked tirelessly to bring attention to the situation of the Uyghur people. I know that, uh, just like me, members of Congress would not have known about your people or the repression they face every day in China were it not for the work of Rabia uh, and many U.S. human rights organizations such as Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, Freedom House, 
and the National Endowment for Democracy. Let me, let me conclude by saying that if I believe that if the United States of America stands for anything, it needs to stand out loud and four square for human rights. Uh, and I believe that that means that we need to stand stronger and firmer and more loudly against the continued repression by the Chinese government, not only against the Uyghur people, but against many other people who choose to raise their voices in dissent or choose to exp have, express a different viewpoint. I think the United States has been too silent uh, in the face of many of the crackdowns in China. And I hope that uh, with your help um, and with your continued uh, support and education of members of Congress and, and education of the American people at large, that you will see Congress and you will see this administration uh, strengthen their resolve in standing for human rights. So, so welcome to Washington. I wish you success with your conference throughout the coming week. Uh, and I am proud to stand with you uh, in the cause uh, of human rights uh, and justice. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Congressman McGovern, for your excellent uh, remark and for your long-standing support of the Uyghur people, and as well as your introduction of many resolutions over the past years. And uh, next, I would like to introduce Congressman uh, Keith Allison, actually, who is traveling today, who is not with us today, but he has sent a message to the uh, conference. So I'd like to read that for you. <coughs> Uh, here is his message uh, he sent us. We invited Congressman Keith Allison to attend the opening ceremony this morning. Unfortunately, he's traveling and cannot make it. Congressman Allison shares our Muslim faith and has been a vocal supporter of the Uyghur human rights cause. In his meeting with Mr. Abiy Qadir last year, Congressman Allison equated Ms. Qadir with Rosa Parks whose portrait was hung in his office. Rosa Parks is one of the most recognized symbols of the civil rights movement here in the United States. It was a much appreciated and honored comparison. Congressman Allison conveys his regret that he is unable to attend today, but wants to reiterate his support for House Resolution 953 from last Congress, uh, which was introduced by Congressman James McGovern. As you may know, the resolution strongly condemns the Chinese government's violent crackdown in July 2009, calls on the Chinese government to cease such crackdowns on the Uyghur people, and urges the U.S. government to raise those human rights concerns in all meetings with the Chinese officials. We thank the congressman for his support. Now I would like to invite uh, and introduce, actually, our longtime supporter and friend, uh, Mr. Carl Gershman, the president of the National Endowment for Democracy. In addition to presiding over the endowment's grants programs in Africa, Asia, Middle East, Eastern Europe, the former Soviet Union, and the Latin America, he has overseen the creation of the quarterly Journal of Democracy. International Forum for Democratic Studies, and the Reagan Fasol Democracy Fellowship Program. He also took the lead in launching in New Delhi in 1999, the World Movement for Democracy, which is a global network of democracy practitioners and scholars. Prior to assuming the position with the endowment, Mr. Gershman was senior counselor to the United States, representative to the United Nations in which capacity he served at the U.S. representative to the U.N.'s third committee that deals with human rights issues and also as 
alternative representative of the U.S. to the U.N. Security Council. Let's warmly welcome Mr. Carl Gershman. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, Rabia Kadir. Um, and uh, let me say what a very impressive uh, gathering this is. Uh, today happens to be, in addition to, you know, the day after we've eliminated uh, Osama bin Laden, it is also World Press Freedom Day. Uh, and on the occasion of World Press Freedom Day, the National Endowment for Democracy in cooperation uh, with some other institutions and in cooperation with UNESCO is celebrating World Press Freedom Day here in Washington at a conference a few blocks from here at the museum. Uh, and last night I had to speak at the opening of that conference on World Press Freedom Day. Um, in coming here, I had um, asked Luisa Griva, who you'll hear from in a while, uh, give me a few notes on what's been happening uh, with our Uyghur friends in the last year. So she gave me a slew of papers. But two of the papers struck my eye. One of them had to do with the introduction in March in the European Parliament of an urgency resolution, an urgency resolution on the destruction of old Kashgar city. And the European Parliament was calling upon UNESCO to recognize old Kashgar city as not just part of the identity of the Uyghur people, but also as part of the heritage of world civilization. And the urgency of the resolution, of course, derived from the fact that, as you all know, uh, the Chinese government is in the process of destroying this very central element of world civilization, old Kashgar city. And they were urgently calling upon UNESCO to recognize the importance of this and to begin to include old Kashgar city in the list of, uh, of protected uh, places in the world. A second piece of paper that I had had to do with the fact that the Chinese government itself had introduced a, uh, a, a motion within UNESCO to have the MESHREP practice included as an intangible, as part of the so-called intangible cultural heritage recognized by UNESCO. The MESHREP, as we all know, is a practice of gatherings, a traditional Uyghur practice, uh, and it's a practice that the Chinese government has banned, as a result of, in, as a result of which we had uh, the uh, Gulja uprising in February of 1997, because they were protesting against the repression and the prohibition upon the Uyghur people to practice this traditional form of community gathering. And yet here was the Chinese government itself introducing something to recognize Meshrep. While it was repressing it, it was also calling upon UNESCO to recognize it as part of uh, the world's cultural heritage. And the, Uyghur, uh, the World Uyghur Congress had distributed this piece of paper that Louisa shared with me, basically saying that the Chinese government was engaged in an act of deception while they repress, while they destroy the traditional culture, they were, in a token way, showing that they recognized it. Maybe they want to send to Disney World. Well, why am I saying this? I'm saying this because last night I had the good fortune at the opening of our World Press Freedom Day event to sit with the Director General of UNESCO. And I had these two pieces of paper. And I was able not only to give these two pieces of paper, one on Kashgar 
the other on Meshrep, to the Director General of UNESCO, but to say this is something that UNESCO must pay attention to. She didn't really know about the Uyghurs. She didn't. She's a wonderful woman, by the way, a Bulgarian woman. First woman, first woman to head UNESCO. And she was very happy to learn about the European Parliament resolution, calling upon UNESCO to try to do what it can to save Kashgar, old Kashgar, and also to understand the background of this introduction by the Chinese of a motion to add the Meshra practice to the list of intangible, li the list of elements that belong on this intangible cu cultural heritage list. So a dialogue has been started with UNESCO. I think that's worthwhile. I think we've got to get the United Nations and especially UNESCO to pay attention to what's happening in old Kashgar city. This is a crime. It's a crime. There is a, a Chinese scholar at the Beijing Normal University, Wu Jiang Tang. And let me, let me just read what he said. He said, the old town also reflects Muslim culture of the Uyghurs very well. It has the original taste and flavor without any changes. Here, Uyghur culture is attached to those raw earth buildings. If they are torn down, the affiliated culture will be destroyed. That's a very serious problem. It's not just a matter of building a few new buildings. It's destroying a culture. And I think, I think this is what's at stake. I think this is what's at stake. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. But what's at stake is the survival of the Uyghur people, the survival of Uyghur culture. One other thing we're doing at the National Endowment for Democracy is that we're working with the United States Memorial Holocaust Museum to create an international working group within the International Governmental Association called the Community of Democracies. There's an international governmental association called the Community of Democracies, which is meeting in Vilnius on June 30th and July 1st. Vilnius has the, Lithuania has the chair of the Community of Democracies. And we're talking about the creation of a working group on the prevention of genocide. If this working group comes into existence, it would be intergovernmental, but also with non-governmental participation. I think it should look at the Uyghur issue. Because the Genocide Convention doesn't only look at the physical destruction of a people. It also says a people can be destroyed if its culture is destroyed. And this is only one dimension of what is happening in Xinjiang, in East Turkestan, Through, under the bilingual education policy, the use of the Uyghur language is being prohibited and destroyed. The practice of religion is being prohibited. I've already spoken about the traditional Meshrep practice. The region is being populated from the east by Han Chinese and the resources for development are being directed at the new 
residents of Xinjiang. And as Rabia Kadir pointed out at the meeting we had last July, on the occasion of the anniversary of the Urumqi massacre, <laughs> young girls from Urumqi and Kashgar and elsewhere in East Turkestan are being sent 3,000 miles to the east to work in factories. Who are these 17-year-old kids? Why are they being sent? Just for employment purposes? They're being sent there so that they won't be raising families. This is part of a more general policy of destroying Uyghur culture and the Uyghur people. This is something that the international community has to recognize. And on top of all that, you have the destruction of old Kashgar city. This is an urgent problem. And it's something the international community must recognize. That has within it a dimension, and I'll be very, very blunt in saying this. I know this is a strong word but I've described the context, it has within it an element of genocide. Now the Uyghur people are repressed. They can't work politically. And yet there is now an emigre Uyghur population here, this, and gathered in this room. And this emigre population has the capacity to speak out, to have meetings in the U.S. Congress, to go to countries like Australia and Norway and elsewhere to raise the issue, to be the voice for the repressed Uyghur people. We have Rabia Kadir, who is recognized internationally with a voice. And you must be the voice, because you live in a society of freedom, you must be the voice of the suppressed Uyghur people. I think you're using that voice well in the way you're beginning to organize, in the way you're learning how American politics works, the European Parliament, Australia. We have to work at every possible level. But one final point. We have to work for Uyghur rights. We have to educate the international community about what is happening and the threat to the survival of the Uyghur people. But to be very frank, the Uyghur people will not be able to be protected and ultimately have their rights respected until China changes. The Uyghur people have a very close relationship in terms of interest with the movement in China for democracy. The movement represented by somebody like Liu Xiaobo, who got the Nobel Peace Prize last December, and we were together, Rabia and I, in Oslo when Liu Xiaobo received the Nobel Peace Prize, and this enormous international recognition. There is a democracy movement in China. Following the uprisings in Tunisia and Egypt, the Chinese government repressed anybody who would even put on the internet the words Jasmine Revolution. They're nervous. They realize that something like that could happen in China. There are over 400 million people on the internet in China. Everyone has cell phones. You cannot hide what is happening in the world. There are people in China who want normal political rights. This was stated in the Charter 08 Declaration 
that was signed by 11,000, more than 11,000 Chinese intellectuals and activists, and is the basis of the Chinese democracy movement. It was signed in, on Human Rights Day, December 10th, 2008, and it was named after the Charter 77 resolution in Czechoslovakia, which ultimately led to democracy in Czechoslovakia, and now two countries, the Czech and Slovak republics. So there's a movement in China. We are supporting that movement. Ultimately, I believe that movement will have a chance to prevail, and there is an article in the Charter 08 Declaration calling for a federation, saying that it would have to be negotiated, because it also relates to Tibet, and in the Chinese view, it also relates to Taiwan. So these are issues that have to be negotiated. But I believe eventually they will be, and it will be part of a new China, a new China that is willing to respect the rights of the minorities that live in China and to grant them full cultural, linguistic, and religious rights. Eventually, that will be worked out. And until that time comes, it is our responsibility collectively to work to preserve the Uyghur people, Uyghur culture, Uyghur identity, the Uyghur language, and to oppose in every way we can the effort by the Chinese government to destroy the Uyghur people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gershman, for your excellent remark. And uh, we are truly blessed to have a great friend like uh, Mr. Gershman, and uh, without whose uh, endowment support, we would not have uh, achieved such great success, both in the United States and around the world, in raising uh, the cause of the Uyghurs. So thank you. And now I would like to uh, introduce U.S. Senator Sherrod Brown who is not with us, unfortunately, but who also sent a message of congratulation and expressing his strong support. Senator Sherrod Brown. Since January 2007, Senator Brown represents Ohio at the U.S. Senate, promoting human rights of the oppressed like us and defending Taiwan from potential Chinese aggression. Senator Brown serves on the powerful Senate Appropriations Committee and the Senate Banking Committee. He also serves on the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee and the Senate Agriculture, Nutrition, Nutrition and Forestry Committee. He's a chairman of the Financial Institutions and Consumer Protection Subcommittee. Prior to serving in the U.S. Senate, Brown served as a U.S. Congressman for the 13th District, Ohio's Secretary of State, and, and as a member of Ohio General Assembly. He also taught at Ohio State University. So here is his message to Ms. Rabia Kadir. Thank you for inviting me to attend this year's meeting. I extend my sincere appreciation and gratitude to the World Uyghur Congress, the Uyghur American Association, the International uh, Uyghur Human Rights and a Democracy Foundation for your continued fight for human rights. Your work reflects the values of peace and prosperity that define the Uyghur people. Thank you for traveling from sites around the world to participate in Uyghur Week in Washington. As you well know, for more than 4,000 years, Uyghur people have inhabited the legendary Silk Road. Uyghurs are a people with a rich cultural heritage, one that has long su supported cultural exchanges between the East and the West. Today, under your leadership, Uyghurs continue to contribute to the diversity of our world, 
in a positive and a peaceful manner. Your work ensures the plight of the Uyghur people is not just confined to prisons and oppressed communities in China. Instead, thanks to your work, the plight of the Uyghur people is known and understood by all people and all governments who believe in human rights, cultural diversity, and religious freedom. For too long, the West has looked the other way as China declares a war on human rights, including its systemic and in intentional attack on the Uyghur culture, language, religion, and the way of life. The United States and all democratic governments must stand up rather than apologize for China's brutal regime. With your tireless advocacy, we will do that. I look, I look forward to working with you to recognize and promote the Uyghur's unique cultural heritage so that it may continue to contribute to the global good for centuries to come. Sincerely, Senator Brown. <laughs> Senator Sherrod Brown also introduced a number of uh, resolutions in support of the Uyghur people at the U.S. Senate. So we are very grateful to have a strong supporter also on the Senate side. Uh, now I would like to introduce Dr. Sue Unawadina Vaughn. I hope I pronounced it correctly. <laughs> Dr. Vaughn currently manages the International Religious Freedom Con Consortium and the Southeast Asia Program at Freedom House. She joined Freedom House in 2009, and during her first year, in addition to overseeing the International Religious Freedom Consortium, she managed the Global Human Rights Program. Prior to joining Freedom House, she served for eight years as a program director at Amnesty International USA, where she directed its global, health, uh, global death penalty abolition campaign. She is highly experienced in mobilizing a diverse range of faith communities to engage in human rights campaigns and has written extensively on ethnic religious identity politics. Dr. Vaughn holds a PhD in government from the University of Texas at Austin uh, with a theoretical focus on ethno-religious nationalism. Let's welcome Dr. Sue Vaughn. <laughs> Thank you, Alan, and thank you to the World Uyghur Congress for having um, Freedom House at this very important event. Um, good morning to everyone, to our congressional guests, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome to members of the Uyghur diaspora community. I bring you good wishes um, from my boss, David Kramer, um, who's Freedom House's executive director. As Carl mentioned, it's well um, Press Freedom Day, and we have an event at the museum, and he's very sad that he can't be here with you today. Um, and he sends his warmest wishes to you all. Um, David has been a friend of the Uyghur community for a very long time um, in various different capacities that he's held, and he sends warm wishes to you, Ms. Kadir. Uh, and Ms. Kadir continues to be an inspiration to us all. Um, Someone said today was a milestone because in addition to this event, it's World Press Freedom Day. Um, next Sunday is also a kind of a milestone um, because it's Mother's Day. And I want to tell you why I personally got involved um, in the Uyghur struggle when I was a program director at Amnesty International. It wasn't just because of the death penalty component. Um, this was around 2001 when my good colleague and friend who might be in the audience, um, Kuma, who's the director of Asia um, programs at Amnesty, told me about this prisoner of conscience, Ms. Rabia Katir, who was a businesswoman and who was separated from her children at the time. My own mother was a businesswoman and my own mother was quite, um, is quite um, vocal when it comes to social justice issues and human rights issues. The only difference was that my mother was never imprisoned 
and has had the freedom to speak, speak uh, freely about issues of concern to us and to our faith community. Um, the story of Ms. Kadir was very inspirational to me personally, and I had the fortune of working on her case when she was a prisoner of conscience, and um, we were ecstatic when she was ultimately able to come to the United States and reunite with her family. It was a very emotional day, um, and it's a memorable one for me personally. Many of you here are unfortunately all too familiar with the litany of human rights abuses that the Uyghur community has been subject to, to over several decades, not just years, but several decades, and the heavy-handed repression that even continues today. Any kind of cultural, ethno-linguistic, or religious expression is deemed quote-unquote separatist, and all kinds of bogus charges are leveled against human rights activists and religious freedom advocates in the name of quote-unquote state security. Both the U.S. State Department and the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom have in their respective recent reports highlighted the worsening plight of the Uyghurs. Chinese authorities have broadened their com campaign of repression to discredit and imprison the community's religious leaders, control the selection of clergy, ban religious gatherings, and control the distribution of religious literature. In addition to subjecting the community to other more routine human rights violations. And it goes on, and it hasn't actually abated, it continues to accelerate. It must be understood for those of us who are concerned about human rights and religious freedom, and those of us who are not concerned about human rights and religious freedom, that these issues are not merely human rights concerns. They also figure prominently into the U.S. international security concerns and into the U.S. security equation. A comprehensive analysis conducted by the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life documented that more than half of the world's population lives in countries with a high or very high degree of government restriction on religion. And this has consequences, not just for those people who are living in those repressive regimes, but for those of us in the United States as well. It is becoming increasingly apparent that to ignore religious freedom and human rights issues in order to pursue trade and security is a dangerous course, and that we do so at our own peril. And this will not ultimately serve U.S. interests. This is certainly the case with China, and I don't think anyone in this room needs any convincing of that. A hero of mine, and probably of many of you in this room, was Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr., who once said that, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Mixing several metaphors here, I know, um, I'm preaching to the choir, and everyone in this room has been vocal in shining a light on the abuse suffered by the Uyghur community. So it remains our collective responsibility that we continue to not be silent. We, the Uyghur diaspora community, we, friends of the Uyghurs in the United States, we are the ones who need to give voice to our vo voiceless Uyghur brothers and sisters in China. And we must ensure that China is consistently reminded of its human rights responsibilities especially to its own citizens. I wish the Uyghur community a productive and successful con conference and hope that you will forge strong ties with each other and forge strong global networks which will further strengthen your struggle. Know that all of us at Freedom House will be standing in strong solidarity with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Van, uh, for your profound support of the Uyghur people and the deep concern of the Uyghurs' human rights issues. And uh, we cannot thank uh, Freedom House enough for co-sponsoring today's historic conference. And also, we are very grateful for uh, former Assistant Secretary of State David Kramer for his long-standing support of the Uyghur people and his interest in Uyghur rights issues. 
And uh, talking about uh, former important uh, State Department officials, uh, we have a very prominent guest here. Uh, next, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Randall Shriver. Uh, Mr. Shriver is president and also chief executive officer of the Project 2049 Institute. He is also the founding partner of Armitage International LLC and a senior associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. He served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs from 2003 to 2005, and also as Chief of Staff and Senior Policy Advisor to then Deputy uh, Secretary of State Richard Armitage from 2001 to 2003. Prior to his work at the State Department, he was an independent consultant and a visiting fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Mr. Shriver has also served as an active duty naval intelligence officer. He has won numerous military and civilian awards uh, from the U.S. government and uh, who was recently presented with the order of the propitious clouds by the President of Taiwan for promoting Taiwan-U.S. relations. And uh, so we are very proud to have uh, the support of Mr. Shriver and uh, thank him for coming to speak, uh, make an official remark at our opening ceremony. Let's warmly welcome Mr. Shriver. Thank you very much. It's, it's really my great honor to be here, and I appreciate the invitation to participate in this conference with you. And Ms. Kadir, it's uh, a great pleasure to see you today. And I'm always inspired uh, when I have the opportunity to meet with you and, and see you and uh, get reinvigorated with the cause and the important work that you're doing. So, so thank you for this work. Um, this is, there's a saying that uh, you're partly judged by the company you keep and I know that today my reputation is enhanced just by virtue of keeping such fine company. Um, you are here for a very important reason, a very important event, and I wish you all well and thank you again for including me. Next week, we'll have a very uh, important meeting between officials of the People's Republic of China and our officials here in the Obama administration. If form holds, this will be one of the largest delegations ever to visit the United States. We'll have two senior state counselors, one who will be a counterpart to our Secretary of the Treasury, Tim Geithner, one who will be a counterpart to our Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton. They'll talk about many issues, and they call this a strategic dialogue, actually a strategic and economic dialogue. But I'm afraid one issue that they won't talk as much about as I think all of us would like them to speak about is the issue of human rights and in particular the issue that our dear friends the Uyghurs face in Xinjiang today. Now why don't they speak about these things at a strategic dialogue? Well they're not unique. This is often the case of administrations of both parties to subjugate human rights issues to a dedicated human rights dialogue which we support of course but there's a tendency to see these as issues that don't rise to the level of importance of, say, North Korea or Iran or South China Sea even. But I'm here to tell you that these are strategic issues. We cannot have a cooperative, productive, normal relationship with China while these abuses continue and the repression continues. What are we to make of a country that has two living Nobel Peace Prize winners, one of whom is in exile and one of whom is in prison? What are we to make of a country that doesn't allow people to worship on Easter Sunday as they're on their way to church? What are we to make of a country that takes a national hero like Ai Weiwei, somebody with impeccable revolutionary credentials, by the way, and detains and imprisons him? You know, psychiatrists, sociologists, they talk about a phenomenon of desensitizing uh, desensitization that can occur if you see too much violence on television, if you see too much of a bad thing, you can almost become numb and desensitized to it. I feel like sometimes our officials are becoming desensitized to these outrages. 
We should not accept that. I hope this conference is productive, and I hope you produce an agenda that's an activist agenda. But let me give you a few of my ideas. I hope Secretary Clinton will take the time and meet with Ms. Kadir. And I hope President Obama will do the same. I was quite honored when I served in the Bush administration when President Bush met twice with Ms. Kadir. I hope this administration I hope this administration will do the same, not just as a symbolic gesture, but to hear firsthand from the most passionate and advocate person representing the people of Xinjiang. I hope that our Congress will continue to put forward these resolutions, but with all due respect, I hope our members get even more ambitious. It's great that there are sense of the Congress resolutions to talk about how we want the repression and the violence to stop, but I think we need a more activist legislation. We have a Tibet Policy Act. We have a Taiwan Relations Act. How about a Uyghur Policy Act? <laughs> if administrations aren't going to take matters into their hands in an appropriate way, let's have Congress do what Congress should do, which is to provide the oversight and force the administration's hands in these matters. I also hope that we will raise this at the strategic dialogue because it is a strategic issue. And I hope that we will continue to raise it in our most impor important forums because, as I said, I don't think we can have a normal and constructive relationship with China until these issues are elevated to that level of importance. So I urge this administration, friends of the administration, those in the opposition to keep hammering away that this is an issue that we want addressed at the highest levels of our government when we interact with Chinese counterparts. Again, thank you very much for the invitation. It's my great honor, and I wish you all the best with your conference. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary Shriver, for your excellent uh, remark and a strong, passionate speech, and especially the wonderful recommendations. Uyghurs would be extremely pleased if one day the U.S. Congress passes a legislation just like you mentioned in support of Tibet and Taiwan in support of the Uyghurs. Thank you. <coughs> and uh, now I would like to introduce uh, one of the champions of human rights in the United States and around the world, Dr. Sophie Richardson. And uh, Dr. Richardson is the Advocacy Director of Human Rights watches Asia Division and oversees the organization's work on China. A graduate of the University of Virginia and the Hopkins Nanjing Program and Oberlin College, Dr. Richardson is the author of numerous articles on domestic Chinese political reform, democratization, human rights in China, Cambodia, Hong Kong, and Philippines. She's just an expert on not only on China, but East Asia as well. She has testified numerous times before the European Parliament, the U.S. House, and the Senate. She has provided commentaries all the time. I see her face on lots of medias, BBC, CNN, ABC, New York Times, Washington Post, you name it. She's everywhere. When there is human rights, there is Dr. Richardson. <laughs> So, and uh, she's also author, she's a prolific writer. She writes not just articles, but books as well. She has written passionately on human rights. And she has this great book uh, uh, called China, Cambodia, and the Five Principles of Peaceful Coexistence. So we are honored to have Dr. Richardson here with us. And uh, let's welcome Dr. Richardson. <laughs> Thank you very much. It is a real pleasure and an honor to be here this morning. I want to start by conveying many of my colleagues' greetings to everyone here, but particularly to Rabia Kadir, who we've had the pleasure of hosting several times and who we have worked with for a long time. I always find it a little bit intimidating 
to speak, particularly in front of an audience that knows far more about these issues than I do, but particularly in front of Mrs. Kadir, who has paid and continues to pay an extraordinary and cruel price for her defense of her people. It's an honor to be here with you. My organization has written for decades now about abuses in Xinjiang, many of which are familiar to you, ranging from restrictions on religious freedom, to the death penalty, to the status of political prisoners. The Chinese government continues to conflate expressions of Uyghur identity, be they cultural, religious, or linguistic, with the three evils of separatism, splitism, and terrorism. This is, in our view, an expression of the Chinese government's hostility towards its obligations under international law. Of even greater concern over the past two years, we have written extensively about the phenomenon of enforced disappearances. <laughs> this is, in the human rights world, one of the most serious kinds of abuses that can take place because it is, by definition, the state disappearing individuals wholly outside of due process. There are no warrants. There is no information given to family members. There is no information whatsoever about what has happened to people. They simply disappear. We have documented this in the wake of the July 2009 protests. We have documented this with respect to the Uyghurs who were refooled from Cambodia to China last year. We have documented this in the case of other refoulement. People who've been disappeared run serious risk of torture or other kinds of ill treatment or worse. Some are simply never found again. And this is, again, in our view, indicative of the Chinese government's intransigence, not just to its commitments under international law, but to its own laws. And this, I think there is no greater statement about a government's unwillingness to play by the rules, be they international or its own, than to disappear people, men, boys, children, adults, women, uh, with no information given to their family members. I want to echo some of the recommendations that have been made this morning. It's not just important to hear people from the U.S. government or other governments recognize the kinds of abuses that Uyghurs live through day in and day out, year after year after year. It is unacceptable for any government to give comfort to the Chinese by meeting with the very architects of these abuses and not meeting with the peaceful leaders of a movement such as this, like Mrs. Kadir. We see no reason, no reason. Why the president couldn't find some time in his schedule between now and next Monday to see Mrs. Kadir before he makes time to see people like Zhou Yongkang and Xi Jinping. In addition, Secretary Clinton said about 18 months ago that, quote, every day is Human Rights Day at the State Department. Well, if every day is Human Rights Day at the State Department, I see no reason why every dialogue with the Chinese government shouldn't be a human rights dialogue. Mm -hmm. And in that respect, I see no reason why every U.S. government agency that's going to be represented in this discussion next week should not go to the table equipped with the case of at least one political prisoner, at least one human rights issue, whether it's environmental, whether it's about labor, whether it's about religion. Every single agency should be raising with its Chinese counterparts a human rights abuse because unfortunately there are still plenty of them to go around. We wish you the very best for a successful discussion this week. We appreciate your leadership and your inspiration, and we look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you very much. Thank you.